Okay, we're back live here. Go ahead. Another thing, well, the training thing that we were talking about, you go in the military and go in the motor pool, that school just for that is six to eight, sometimes ten weeks. <clears throat> Minimum of six weeks. Truck drivers go, I know schools is like a mountain three, uh, and they're getting their city L's in three weeks. Let me explain something. It ain't a point of who's better, who's making more money or nothing like that. Like he said, you can go to prison. You can live with a burden on your life for the rest of your days, even if you're in prison or not, that you killed a kid. This is this machine that you're in, I don't care what brand it is, who makes it, who's the company, is, can do a lot of damage. There's an old saying that truck driver you say, well, we're rolling time bomb, we're rolling tank. That's what you are. You can do mass destruction with a truck. But you need to be adequately trained. This ain't got nothing to do with anybody. Swift guys is out there. You want to know why you, J.B. Hunt, Nitrification, FedEx, is some of the most livestock trucks, and why, as they put it in truck magazine, the most hated trucking companies on the road? They do not train you. They're more interested in a dollar. Hear me out, guys and gals. Them big companies are more interested in the dollar versus you or your life. We all hear the same speech. Come join J.B. Hunt. Come join Warner. Here's your family. You're not a number. How many times have you ever called your dispatcher and have given them, I'm driver so-and-so? You never said, hey, my name's Cameron Simmons or Kid or whatever. You have to give them a driver number. I'll tell Guess you. what? You a number. He just mentioned a company. I'm not going to mention them again. You don't have to. But I have spoke with a driver that said, man, I will get on there and call them if I've got a problem with the truck. And it'll take me three or four hours to ever get somebody on the phone. And I've heard at a different location, when I'm at a TA truck stop, the lady at the TA behind the counter who calls those numbers in for the shop, she's told me the same thing. Another guy at another shop, he's the manager of that shop. He don't matter which one it is, they all tell me this. He told me the same story. He's like, oh, you know, your company's easy to deal with and you're easy to deal with. And, you know, um, got your name right here and everything all your info no worries um and efs or whatever you want to pay for it or cash and the thing is um that's something you might want to look at too is uh they will hold you out there and your 14 hour clock does not stop and so it's however many hours doing that however many hours for the mechanic to fix the truck if you're on the side of the road how long it takes for them to get to you and if they got to go back and forth for parts you need to know your stuff so they don't have to search many parts they'll know what it is before they get out there but you need to you need to keep in mind these companies are trying to get you in and get you out and they'll lie to you they'll say oh you're going to make 500 600 700 miles a day divide that by whatever you get your calculator out you think you're going to make that much money not in the snow not with a breakdown by the end of the week you can wind up with nothing look so Go ahead, tell them, kid. They're trying to grind them out. It's like puppy mills, you know. Um, it's gotten pretty bad. When I'm sitting here and I'm being held up at a fuel aisle, a lot. So many times that at any point, at any truck stop I want to go to, I could just hit the button and show these people having to take 30-minute breaks on the fuel aisle because they don't know how to even back up. And they're scared to ask for help or, or never learned it. But they're like, well, I got my CDL and I got through training. But they're taking, they've been told to take the brakes on the fuel aisle, whether it holds us up for hauling freight or not, just because they're scared to back up in between two other trucks because they can't and they might hit something. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem. That means you can't, what if the officer told you to back up in a straight line? That's on a car test. Look, you need to learn how to drive that truck before you get out here. Even if you got to ask for more time or ask for more training or ask for help, you need to get that training there before you bring that mess out here and they're dumping these drivers on us like it's our job they act like it's our job to help finish training their driver i go i got no problem with helping anybody but actually training them how to drive a truck you need a a closed course with no other trucks around and some cones so if you run something over you just hurting cones you know what i mean companies out there it's not our job to finish them up for you a lot of that's going to have to stop. But uh, you need to train them, not with a guy in the sleeper, with a guy in the passenger seat. Yeah, I just told you a little secret. You can get mad if you want. Well, it's causing accidents on the road. You're getting people killed. Look up the statistics. It's making the rest of us look bad. We're tired of watching it. Go ahead, kid. 
You made an excellent point there talking about at the truck stops it taking a couple hours to do this and that. When I started driving uh, over the road, like I said, I've been driving uh, since I was about 16 under farm law. Uh, I went to work for a company called uh, Government Transport. Uh, I don't, I can't really give you no advice on the company. I didn't stay with them that long. I went to work with them pretty much to have my name on the insurance company for three weeks. That way, when I went to another company I went to work for and stay with for about five years or four and a half years, that's all they needed, some kind of verifiable that I had previously worked somewhere else before. Uh, that was back when you could do that. I don't know about it now. But anyway, uh, I would uh, go somewhere, call a bit. Well, I delivered calling a broker because at that time we didn't really have e-logs. They just had to put them in with the uh, thing that would tell you your load. It would take me sometimes three hours to hear back. And then when they would call me back, would ask me my driver ID number. Like I was opening a bank account. Guys, listen to me. <laughs> when, when you're driving for a company, uh, I can understand if you had a top cigarette load for the U.S. government. I can understand uh, all the procedures on that. But when you're hauling apples in the state of Washington, which is where this happens, uh, and it takes me three hours to get something done, and I've got to tell you all this crap. Crap, you should know. I should just have to give you a truck number, and you should know who I am. There's something wrong with that. You've eaten up my time. That's what we're getting at. That's the point. Your time out here is just as precious as anybody that goes to work a nine to five, a first, second, third shift job, and home with their families. Down Your to the minute and precious. Down to the minute and down to the penny. And they should, as because, many many GPSs as they have, I think I swallowed a pill at one company for, it was a GPS. <laughs> no, but for real, they got GPS on the truck, GPS on the computer log, GPS. They know everything about you. And when you call in on the phone, it pops up your number. They shouldn't ask you questions. They should be giving you results. And, and see, like you were saying, every second, you guys and gals, you're paid either by the mile or by the load. Either way, you can break it down. You're getting paid by the mile. I don't care if you're getting paid 50% of the load, 25% of the load. You know how much that load pays. You know how many miles it is, so therefore you get paid by the mile. Me sitting somewhere three, four, five, six, seven hours is not getting paid. You can figure it up. Your hourly rate for the moment you leave your front store, your home terminal, until you return. Guys, you break that down, you probably don't want to drive a truck because you're making very, very little. About a dollar, some of them about 25 cents an hour. My point is, the more that these wheels are rolling with a load, is the more money we can make. Meaning, there's going to be times we're going to sit somewhere four, five, six hours. We're going to get detention. We're pushing for detention. And also, guys, another thing on this black smoke, shut down. This is something my group's pushing, live acts. No more lumber fees. Y'all guys hear me this? Our operators just really does apply to us <coughs> because company drivers don't necessarily have to pay it, but no more lumber fees. These people that's unloading these trucks get paid an hourly wage. It's their stuff we're delivering. We're hauling it and having to pay to get it unloaded. Come on, guys. Yep. Not doing it. Yep. And the brokers got their hand in it, and they're, you know, it starts out the loads. Probably by the, even by the time it gets to the company, it's paying like six to eight dollars a mile, and then they get a fuel surcharge on top of it. Sometimes they don't give you all your free fuel surcharge. These companies are some of them are ripoffs, and then some of them are you know like I said, they're trying to keep you at a dollar a mile and whatever, and tell you how great it is. Uh, the truth is, they could be paying you a lot more money, and you could have a huge living wage that you could take a lot more time off and and go to Acapulco, do do stuff real people do, you know that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's it's gotten a little bit out of hand, and we're out here um, sleeping in a doghouse. You know, um, it's it's uh, they they can't understand it because they don't live this lifestyle. Um, and all they see is a dollar. That's all they see. Right, right, and and even the companies that want to say, "Oh, we have our whatever ride with the driver for a little bit," and they get a little taste of it and this kind of thing. But the truth is, they're still keeping the money. They're still not paying you what you could be making. And they're making millions. Every Christmas, they want to say, look, we're a multi-billion dollar corporation, and we made this much this Christmas, pat everybody on the back. But then when you say, well, hey, um, you know, uh, at what point are you going to give the drivers a raise? Oh, we can't afford that. It's a penny's business. 
<laughs> it is a penny's business, but look at look at how you you're you're the one getting the pennies. The other one getting the I'll dollars. Make a point. <laughs> While you're doing that, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm going to make a point. Go ahead. A lot of these countries that does lumber fees, Walmart, stuff like that, all these DCs, guys and gals, listen, for every 10 loads they get, they're getting a load for free. That is a fact from the lumber fee. We're paying for them to unload. Now, these are Walmart employees at DCs, Costco, whatever. you got to think, for every 10 loads they get, they're charging $100 a lick, sometimes more, for a lumber fee because... Their employees got to break it down, but their employees are getting paid $10, $15 an hour, depending on where you go. For every tenth load that comes in that building, they don't have nothing in it. If you if you use the money they're getting back for a lumper, they've technically not got any money in it. Also, as far as the brokers go, you might have three or four brokers in on one load. Meaning, and I want you to understand me on this, on brokered freight. Used to, you dealt with one broker, one broker only. Now, when my daddy drove, there was no telling how many times I've heard him call one individual. He booked the load. He might have made five, a nickel to ten cents a mile, the broker did. But he had several trucks, so he made a good living off of it. All right. Now you've got four, five, three, ever how many? You've got multiple brokers on loads. you got a head broker, and then you got an established broker, which gets the load from the head broker. The head broker just goes all over the country, finds these loads, goes to these small businesses, finds these loads. And then you've got the main broker that you deal with. Everybody's getting a piece of this pie, whether it be 25, 50 cents a mile. So a load you're getting paid, a dollar ten, dollar fifty mile, really played about three fifty four dollars a mile. Yeah, and I'll say something else too. There's some of these companies that have, under the guise of acting like they no longer charge uh, broker fees, here's the thing. They are. They, the they, they still are. No, I'm talking about when you get to the dock. Okay, in one of the box, you know, places, um, and they say, "Oh, you don't have to anymore have a EFS or a T check or a Com check or anything to pay for the lumper because uh, we've taken care of that for you." Well, the thing is, they're still taking it out of the load. Yeah. You just don't have to write a check for it because they built it in. But you're still not going to make that much of a difference. They're still they're basically blinding you from what they're doing now. You just don't have to waste time filling out a, a com check or an EFS, and you think they're doing you a favor to pay for that lumber fee uh, automatically. No, it's automatically taken out and figured in before it hits the first broker at the front end. Uh, so they're still the broker's still making money. They're charging you to unload it. Um, and if it's not a lumper that's actually an independent person that whatever, even if it's a service, they need to quit floor loading and trying to get so much stuff on one trailer so they have to have it anyhow. They need you to put it on a forklift so you can pick it up and put it in their warehouse. It's not your job to manage every square inch of their warehouse with your money. That's what's happening. But now they're blinding it from you. So don't think they're not charging you lumper fees just because you don't fill out an EFS or a T-check or a comp check or pay them cash anymore. They are hiding it from you within the price of freight and it's coming off of your percentage. And I'll tell you something else, too. I've done this when I was pulling a chicken wagon around. Ladies and gentlemen, it is owner-operators, it is paying the lumber fees. Kind of drivers, I think you can probably get away with it, too. When you pay somebody to do something, therefore you are entitled to them. They're your employee. So what I would used to do when I found out there was a lumber fee on something, there was no kids sitting for three or four hours. I'm paying you to do a job. I can understand an hour to unload. My wagon, I can understand that. But if it was past that, I would go in there and tell them, you're paying these individuals, guys and gals. You are. Not the company. You are paying these people to work. Therefore, you are their boss. Therefore, they're working for you for that small period of time. If it's taken, if they're charging you a lumper fee, which you have to pay, I don't give a rat's rear if it's $10 to unload the wagon. You have a right as an employer. This comes from a TVC law firm, by the way. Uh, to go in there and tell them they can either unload your wagon and start on it right then, or they must waive the right of the lumber fee. Not just that. Nobody can hold you up by law. You have a right to call a federal marshal and them show up there and you say, these people are holding me up and they've said it's going to be, you know, 10 hours and I've got to go pick up my next load. My boss says I got to be there. And they'll tell them, you've got 30 minutes to unload his truck or he's leaving. And it's one of those things where, they, they've gotten it to where instead of, sorry, it was a loud Russian walk by. 
instead of um, instead of unloading a truck and then putting it in a certain place and then them figuring out a way to stack it up later, they in order to use the floor space behind your truck, they pull off whatever would make a pallet, then they stack it up, and then they shrink wrap it, and all that's all wasted time, and then if they have, well, we've got four trucks ahead of you, it's going to be, you know, four hours, or six hours, or ten hours before we can even start touching you, or whatever their excuse is, then it's going to be another, you know, four hours to unload you, because they wanted to use all that cube space and floor load it, then they got to transfer it to a pallet, so it's on slip paper in your, and it's floor to ceiling, it takes a bunch of guys climbing in there, um, you know, if you accept loads like that, even it's it's. But they need to stop doing that, um, because they're wasting our time. So for them to get cheaper freight, we're paying for the lumper, so that don't cost them nothing. We're paying, we're using losing our time to get unloaded. That don't cost them nothing, and they get more freight on a trailer. Who's getting ripped off in that scenario? We are. In time and in money for the lumper, wouldn't even need a lumper. Put it on a pallet get it off the trailer you know what are you I, saving I, maybe I maybe, maybe three loads a year they'd have to pay for more but the truth is um you know just don't haul it too you know we got to stop hauling freight for these companies that are paying cheap and here's the thing i understand there's a lot of people who have been out of work and they look at trucking as a viable option and they're like hey i'm gonna use this thing i'm gonna work here for six months or a year make some money and then go do something else well, the thing is, even you guys, um, look at how much they're paying you per mile, and um, don't even get ripped off for the time you're there because you're getting you're hauling cheap freight for them, and it's making the whole system like a deck of cards that's ready to fall in on itself, and you're the weak link, you know. Um, we all have to uh, stand up for ourselves, not get held up and. Well, they're fixing to be doing it April 12th. You know, they're going to stand up for us. Like it or not, here it comes. You've been told, you know. Um, go ahead, kid. I, I guess I went off on a tangent. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I'm, you mean, like I said, we're just trying to cover everything, even though it's taking different segments to do it. But we've, yeah. me and him, me and Mr. Truck and stuff there has had put several, I don't know how many hours, brother, we put in there. <laughs> I know yeah. about almost two hours in one night. Yeah. Uh, well, matter of fact, while I was at home spending time with my wife, this stuff's that important that I took time away. And me and Mr. Truck and stuff, about two hours, probably about two and a half hours, discussing what we were going to talk about before we ever went. Yeah, and, and then, it, then we tried to record it. We tried to record it for an hour and 20 minutes, and the phone, for some reason, after so many minutes, shut down. And here's what I'm going to do. We're at 17 minutes. With that, I'll hit the button. We'll drop another one. Hold tight. <laughs>